Thank you, Carla. That was beautiful. Good morning. Well, sometime in this uh, week, I decided that we were um, long overdue for a stewardship series. I have not preached a stewardship series in some time, and um, we'll be beginning today, as you can see uh, on your cover. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of flesh in the cover. And we're talking about the stewardship of our bodies or tissue today as we begin uh, our series on what it means to be a steward. Uh, there's a lot of joy involved with it. The opening hymn is hymn number 544. We're going to sing all seven verses, O Love How Deep. When you get to verse 7, if you can rise, you are invited to do so. And also today we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, if you would uh, be able to um, read the communion statement uh, to prepare for communion today. That would be a blessing to all of us. And so, um, again, our opening hymn, 544, verses 1 through 7. the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since 
since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seek his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father has had mercy on us and given his only begotten Son to die for you and for me and for his sake he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sin. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm today is on page 3 in your bulletin. Psalm 128, we read it responsively. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the fruit of the earth, you will be happy, and you will go well for you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. The Lord bless you from Zion, and may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Indeed, may his fear children his children, peace be upon be with you. And also with you. The collect today is on page four in your bulletin. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you came into the flesh to redeem both our flesh and spirit. We praise you for this great sacrifice. Help us to glorify you through our body 
As we care for the body that you have gifted us with, may we remember that good stewardship flows from the heart through faith in you. Bless our faith that it may be growing and therefore guide how we steward our bodies. Give us wisdom as we prioritize our relationships and physical work. As Adam was created first alone, bless those who are single in their station in life. And for those who desire a godly spouse, bless that quest and give contentment in whatever circumstances they are in. Bless all marriages that husband and wife would be forgiving towards one another and committed to each other fully. We praise you for our body, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Maybe see. The Old Testament reading today is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just rest retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and, the, and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the verse of the day and our gospel reading. 
In your bulletin on page 5, near the top, you'll see today's verse from Mark chapter 10, verse 8. Please join with me as we recite the verse together. We read, The two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. The Holy Gospel for the 20th Sunday after the celebration of Pentecost is recorded in Mark chapter 10, beginning at the second verse. Glory to you, o Lord. The Pharisees came up, and in order to test Jesus, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. And do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. In your bulletin, the creed is on page 6. It's also in your hymnal on page 206. We confess, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his far before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not man, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things for men, who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is both by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. A sermon hymn is hymn 783, Take My Life and Let It Be.
you in peace from God our Father, from God our Son, and God the Holy Spirit, this triune God who is the creator and owner of all things. And as we remember creation going back to Genesis today, we remember he created it ex nihilo, out of nothing, with only his voice, his living word. We also remember that Jesus, the Christ, took upon himself the flesh and experienced all that we experience, growth, stewardship challenges, even death. And he became the first fruits of the resurrection in the new glorified body so that we could see our future and begin to live there by the gift of faith. We also remember God, the Holy Spirit, who by the gift of faith through the word and the sacrament of baptism dwells in our soul, which is in our body, so that we might become stewards, honored, faithful stewards. So as we begin this stewardship series, we begin with what's right before us, our hand, no, our body, and what's maybe not so apparent, which is our soul. And you may remember, as soon as I mentioned soul, that there is that parable in Luke 12 about the rich man, which ends with God coming back to get what he gave. That is, this night your soul will be required of you. The owner will reclaim what has been lent to us in life, especially our soul, and of course our body, and through the gift of faith, he will give us a brand new one that will be indelible. When I have been teaching stewardship throughout the years, my understanding of stewardship has grown, and for years I referred to the seven T's of stewardship. Those are, by the way, in your bulletin insert. You might want to reference them. Time, talent, treasure, tissue, trash, truth, trust. And then as I looked at this series and I realized, well, you know what? We've got two more weeks to finish out the year. And I saw two more T's that we steward. One is totality, everything. And one is Thanksgiving. We actually steward Thanksgiving. Uh, we are supposed to be in charge of thanks, and God, of course, wants us to give thanks always. As you uh, think about this concept, many people you know, suddenly get sort of morose and, oh no, stewardship, here we go. But instead, when we focus on the body and when we start with the body, we need to step back to Psalm 139, where David takes in the whole thing, including the visible and invisible, and then looks at his own body, not even grasping a portion of what you and I understand because of medicine and advances today. And he says, behold, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Indeed, our body is something to cherish and to give thanks for and to awe, take awe at. And as we are confronted with uh, the bulletin in today's cover, that's the word I've chosen to use, confronted with the bulletin, you're certainly aware of the body. It is emphasizing the flesh. So I wanted to begin by talking about um, some of the wonders of the body, just a very short list. We could just go on and on and on about the body. But as you look at this picture, you see the flesh, uh, you may do a search and search, you know, what is the largest organ in your body? It is indeed the flesh, well, with an asterisk. The flesh actually takes up 15% of our body weight. That's a relief. If I put any weight on it, I can see it's just the flesh. Don't worry about it. And it takes up about 22 square feet in surface area. But as we discover, as we search God's word, and also as we learn more about his creation and world, um, things are not always what they appear. We forget that there are things inside of us, just as the body contains a soul, it also contains our small intestine. Uh, now, for some reason, as a parent, at some point, I needed to learn more about the small intestine because it became important for my daughter, Jennifer. And I learned that the small intestine is actually the largest organ in the body when it comes to surface area. 30 square meters of surface area, 320 square feet. 
you never thought there was that much surface area in your small intestine. But that's because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has made us more than what we see, and that's true over and over and over again. So in the small intestine, he put fold upon fold upon fold inside of that so that we could more efficiently and effectively digest our food. So you got basically a living room inside of your gut, 320 square feet of interlining. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that actually takes us to our verse for the day, thinking about being more than what we are. So the verse for the day is on page five. I'd like you to once again read that verse with me. Uh, page five in your bulletin, you'll see the bold print, Mark 10, verse eight, and we read it together. The two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Shall become. Really, the verse is about growth. The verse is not so much about where I'm at now, but what I will be. And the irony is that numerically, you become more by becoming less. The two shall become one flesh. Hopefully when you think about stewardship or the stewardship of marriage especially and you remember those words in Ephesians about husband and wife and their various roles, St. Paul also quotes this particular verse which is quoted often in scripture. Maybe God wants us to get our verse of the day down pat. And then he says that faith is a lot like marriage. In fact, he calls it a big mystery. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 5. Quoting again the Genesis verse, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he adds, this is a big mystery, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So as we talk about stewardship, we grow when we become less, less about ourselves and more about being one with Christ. And as we grow, I want to remind people, you do your growing in Christ, in Ephesians 4.15. I grow up into him. That's the gospel. Jesus always has me covered, just like the flesh on the, on the picture here. God is on the outside. All those baptisms in Christ are robed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. So then I am free as a steward. I am without shame as a steward. I am robed with Christ's righteousness, and so I do my growing in the security of forgiveness, which has been freely bestowed upon me. As we understand stewardship, we also understand that growth occurs when faith grows. There's another uh, stewardship topic that we'll be exploring. And also when understanding grows. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, St. Peter says at the end of his epistle. The Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, I don't often give thanks for it enough, but I am very blessed by being in this particular denomination for so many reasons. They have an excellent stewardship resource, and you will be receiving that week by week starting next week. Um, and in that, there's a beautiful definition of stewardship that I want you to meditate upon, and, and we'll be revisiting throughout the series this, this uh, definition. The free and joyous activity of the child of God and God's family, the church, in managing all of life and life's resources for God's purposes. Joy, freedom, all of life and life's resources. That sounds like totality, and it is, and of course that's another stewardship subject we will get to near the end. But as we think about where it all starts, it starts off with our body. And if you think about the Ten Commandments, really the Ten Commandments are really hard to separate from the body. All of them could be understand, we can understand as being about the body. And you think about the many, many things we have to steward because of our body, the food that we eat, the sleep that we get, or not. The exercise we engage in, or not. The company we keep, or the company we do not keep. What we think about, 
or what we try not to think about, which is often a godly thing. The attitude that we carry around, the way we think, of course, Scripture says we have the mind of Christ. The attitude we have about our work, our station in life, our contentment, and of course, how we think about Christ, our Savior, and his relationship to us every single day as we walk by faith. Contentment is a word you may have heard in that, and that is really foundational in our idea of stewardship of the body. In fact, I think we should probably simply rephrase it, contentment in Christ, because that's where it all starts. Am I content in Christ? The two should become one flesh. As God takes over my life day by day as I grow into him, am I content in that relationship or discontent? The first sin was really one of sowing discontentment. Satan took what was perfect and made Eve believe that she had something less than what she wanted. Sowing discontentment always involves distortion. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Of course, that was gross hyperbole. God said, you can eat from any tree in the garden except one. She had what she was. She was literally perfect, and yet he distorted her thinking into thinking that she needed something else to be complete, to be content. He sowed discontentment. That's what started to grow in her. In the same section of Ephesians 5 that Paul, I quoted earlier, was talking about marriage and the mystery of Christ uh, and the church being really what he was talking about. In the very next section, Paul says this verse, which some people take umbrage with. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. In fact, we discover that many people are not content with their own flesh. And I think to a large degree, this has been because they have embraced or believed the sowing discontentment that they have seen or heard. It is distorted thinking. Paul is describing the foolishness of not caring for or nourishing your, your flesh. If you're discontent with your flesh, in one sense, you're not caring for it. It is a gift from God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. It is amazing thing. But indeed, all of us at some point, I think, are discontented about some aspect of the way that we live in the flesh. As a lesson in contentment, the LCMS Bible study on the first session, which by the way, and I didn't know this until I discovered it has also eight sessions, um, it begins by directing our attention to that beautiful Old Testament story of Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. I oftentimes say that Joseph became Joseph because his father Jacob had poured so much love into his son. Now, there was nothing wrong about the amount of love that Jacob gave him. The problem was it was disproportionate love. He didn't do the same thing with all 12 sons. If he had, oh my goodness, what would all 12 of them have become? But as I think about Joseph, I also think about St. Paul and his words, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Beautiful passage from Philippians 4. And Paul also had been in many difficult circumstances, which he lists in 2 Corinthians 11. Read that if you want to know how Paul was, just, how Paul was content in all circumstances. So Joseph was content, but we don't want to miss the fact that when his brothers were literally selling him into slavery, we find out much later in the story a detail which is significant. He cried out to his brothers not to do what they were doing. To be a steward and to be content doesn't mean that we don't speak the truth. We have to hold accountable those people around us, including ourselves, who are not being good stewards. But as we look at the life of Joseph after that 
sold into slavery moment. Obviously, being a slave is not easy. And then he ends up, because he trusts God and is content in whatever circumstance, he says, I'm a slave. I'm going to be the best slave I can be. And son of a gun, if he wasn't. And so we soon see Joseph elevated to the chief steward in the household of Potiphar. And even there, most of you know the account, Satan will sow discontent. So Potiphar's wife, who really had so much, so much more than any of the servants, she fixed her eyes on Joseph and said, I'm discontent. And so you know how the story went. She appeals to him when the house is empty to commit adultery. Remember that a big part of stewardship is what also to avoid and how those relationships change. In fact, even the Genesis verse, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, there is a relationship change that needs to happen as all things occur. And so Satan doesn't like that when we are content in all circumstances, and so he didn't like the fact that Joseph was being faithful. And so Joseph, interestingly enough, has always been aware, whenever temptation comes along, that there's really two chief characters involved in that besides himself. Satan, the distorter, the one who sows discontentment, the tempter, and God the tester. What will you do now? Let's see. Will you be my steward or fall slave to someone else? So after she makes this first poignant appeal this way, this crass way, this open way, what does Joseph say to her? He says a number of things, but it culminates with this statement. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me. That is Potiphar, Joseph says, has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I do this great evil and sin against, what's the next word? God. Not Potiphar, but God. He's well aware that in the stewardship life, he is content in his relationship with God, and that's why he can say, I need to separate myself from certain things that are not godly, that are not going to strengthen my stewardship life. Faith always brings to mind our Heavenly Father, and faith always brings to mind that he understands our circumstances. He is well aware of them. What did Jesus say to Saul when he was persecuting the church? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, not the church. God feels what we experience. Even though Joseph did the right thing, of course, he was thrown into another prison, another sort of slavery. And what did he say at this point? Bahamut? Here I am, a slave, slave, twice over. I'll be the best slave I can be. I'll be the best prisoner I can be. And lo and behold, that's what he was. A key to content is saying wherever I am, whether it be married, unmarried, married, whether it be student, whether it be working hard, whether it be decrepit in a bed and hanging out with my mom lately, I'm spending a lot of time in nursing homes, and when my body fails, if I get to that point, I will need to adjust to a new stewardship reality. Many of you know that my oldest daughter, Jennifer, had acute cerebral palsy. I often describe her body as broken. She couldn't walk. She couldn't talk. She couldn't even eat. But the one thing that Jennifer did is she trusted God in those circumstances. She had a certain contentment. I'm always amazed at people who don't want to do things, whether it be in church or in a household where kids don't want to do their chores or whatever. 
Because as I think about my daughter, Jennifer, she would have loved to do things. Being a steward is, of course, Ephesians 2.10. Being created in Christ Jesus to do, to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. The secret of being content in Christ is realizing I am created in Christ Jesus. He has put me here in this incredible body with an incredible blessing. I've already got one foot in heaven because of the gift of faith. I'm living with great optimism and freedom, and he has chosen to bless me with a position of authority and responsibility because he trusts me. It's all his. He says, you know, I'm going to step out of the room for a while. You take over. Wow. The scripture says, it is not clear what we shall become, what we will become. But we are always becoming. In Christ Jesus, we are always growing. They shall become one flesh. I leave you with a, another definition of stewardship. The, the Greek word means household manager, which is a beautiful word. But the English word, steward, comes from a word they would say, sty word, as in pigsty. The ward of the sty. The guy in charge of the meat for the king. He was a sty word, or a steward. So what did he probably think? Yeah, I'll be the best caretaker of pigs I can be. Stewards sometimes have very humble circumstances. But God has entrusted you with those circumstances. And one day, and we talked about this a lot with my daughter, the promise is you will be freed from the limitations of this life, including sin and a body, yes, that is growing weaker. Paul has a beautiful verse for us to end with about perfection. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay a hold of that for which I was laid a hold of in Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself of laying a hold of it yet, but I forget what lies behind, and I press on forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the goal and the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, remember, as many as are perfect, that you have this attitude. Did you hear what he said? Not that I'm perfect, but I am perfect. As Christians, we are at the same time sinner and saint. That's who you are. Don't let it burden you. Focus on the saint side. That's what God sees. That's the robe. That's being in Christ. And in Christ, you are free and entrusted with stewardship. Amen. And then by the peace of God, which goes beyond what we understand, may that guard our hearts and minds to keep us strong in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we rise and we sing the offertory hymn, verses 1 and 4 of hymn number 858, O Father, all created.
and we receive your offerings and your prayers. You may be seated. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the owner and creator of all things. We thank you, Lord, for your trust in us. We thank you for your stewardship of the gospel, that you desired to come into the flesh because you wanted fellowship with us, you wanted intimacy with us, you wanted us to walk by faith and every day look to you, not only to give us what we need, but to return to you what is yours, everything. Bless us, Lord, in our stewardship life. In your name we pray, amen. A prayer from Darrell Dorr for Noah's uh, grandfather, not me, uh, Bruce, who's turning 80 today. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be there someday. Happy birthday, Grandpa Bruce. Um, also, Gabe uh, is praying for his aunt, um, that she would feel better. Um, she has uh, an ailment in her stomach. Um, also, safe travel for all who are traveling. Uh, Jackie Champion, uh, for her friend Isra, who is in Lebanon. She is very scared. Um, also, Jackie is praying for her grandfather, who is uh, dealing with cancer, Pastor Alan Coltman. Um, Sharon Rick Bryant, for a good friend, Todd Bruds, currently uh, battling an infection in the ICU and is in need of a miracle. So it's very serious. Um, for victims of the flooding down south and for peace in Israel, we need to pray that one in faith. Jason is praying for a friend Peter, who was just diagnosed with leukemia. 
And Rick and Sherry also um, celebrating the engagement of Corey and Allison, her son Corey. Let's rise for these prayers. Lord, there are many physical burdens that we are afflicted with in this life with a physical body. In spite of the incredible defenses you have built into our own system, in a fallen world, Lord, people get ill. We pray for Jason's friend Peter, just diagnosed with leukemia. We pray that in your mercy and in your kingdom of the left, you would help uh, all those who care for him uh, and defend him. And may he learn to trust in you in whatever circumstances he is in. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Todd Bruds, who is battling a very serious infection. Lord, we ask that you would, um, at this point, do what seems like a miracle is needed and restore his body. Help him also to trust in you during this time of affliction. Father, be with Pastor Alan Kochman as he battles his cancer. Um, may he be strong in faith, and we give thanks for that faith, and also bless his body and those who care for him. We pray for those who are uh, also not feeling well. Uh, Gabe's aunt, who uh, has had a pretty serious stomach ailment, bless her as she deals with this. We also pray for those who are caught up in strife, Lord. We do pray for peace in this world, we are blessed in this land with relative peace. We pray, Lord, that others might have the same, especially in the Middle East. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Isra, who is in Lebanon. She is very scared, as we can imagine what that would be like, having bombs falling every day near you. Pray your protection for her and for a cease to this distress and violence. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who suffer flooding uh, in the south, uh, help restoration come. We ask, Lord, that you would also be with those who travel, um, thankful to have them here today and be with them in their many travels wherever they go. Protect them on their journey. May they arrive at their safe destination and know that you are part of that journey. We um, thank you, Lord, for the celebrations we have among us. We thank you for... Uh, Noah's grandfather, Bruce, celebrating his 80th birthday today. And we also give you thanks, Lord, for the engagement celebration of Corey and Allison. Bless them in their pending plans and their future marriage. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. We prepare for communion with the preface. If you turn to page 6 in your bulletin, you will see the preface or page 208 in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. For the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we may not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. 
For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us to this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Um, just a couple of reminders. This uh, Tuesday evening, we have our adult catechesis class. Everyone is invited. I'll send in another invite with the link for Zoom if you'd uh, rather remain at home and participate. Um, any other announcements? In the back, Lisa. Lutheran Student Fellowship will meet on campus tomorrow night, Monday at 6 p.m. in the Angle Wheeler Hall. Thank you. Quick reminder, I talked about the banquet already. I still have room. If you want more information about the Ithaca Pregnancy Center fundraising banquet, there's a nice little poster that Hannah printed up on the circular desk up front. Or let me know. And Mary, what was the date of the Ithaca Pregnancy Center? By next weekend, I have to know for reservations. And then the, it's November 8th at 6 p.m. November 8th. Okay. Thank you. I see our wounded craft lady. Okay. I just wanted to let everybody know that um, if you go to the drive-in um, website, they have a double matching gift for anybody who wants to donate to the people down North Carolina and more that they would help up to five hundred thousand dollars. So. Thank you, Vivian. All right. Very good. Um, let us go with the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.